10 through 17. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. How long? 18 years. And was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. He laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the rulers of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. Look at how he conducts his situation and said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work, in them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he has said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed and all the people rejoiced. Look at that. The adversaries were ashamed and the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by the conductor, the master conductor, the Lord of glory himself and all the people of God said amen remain standing. My subject, I'm going to use a subtopic which I seldom do, but my subject is a symphony in a synagogue. A symphony in a synagogue. You cannot have a symphony if you don't have a conductor. A conductor controls every sound that makes up the symphony. God is. My subtitle is, you don't have to have everything to do anything. This is a liberating word for you because you have been waiting on everything to be lined up right, waiting on everything to fall into alignment, in order for you to move forward, you don't have to have everything to do anything because you have a conductor who can handle both your adversaries, your antagonists, and your protagonists all at the same time. Can the church say amen? amen. Father, anoint this word and let it come to life while it's yet being preached. Let it strengthen us and challenge us. Let it nurture us and stimulate us. Let it change us and fortify us. Let it correct us. Let it lead us into your divine will as you orchestrate our affairs as only God can do. For this we give you praise honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. <laughs> Somebody holler, conduct this thing. In our text, Jesus continues to reach out to the synagogues. But you must understand that Jesus was not always well handled in the synagogues. 
he goes there and wrestles with the theological complexities surrounding the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And most of the time when we hear Pharisees and Sadducees, we hear them together like they are really together, but they are not really together. They don't like each other. They are enemies who have joined together to fight Jesus. The first time we see him in the temple is eight days old, when we later see him being baptized by John in the Jordan River, he gets up and he goes into the temple and reads Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God hath anointed me to preach the gospel, to bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted, to loose the bound, to set in captives those uh, that are bound and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus was not afraid to go in tough places. He started in the synagogues at the age of 12. You remember when his mama left him in the synagogue and came back and he confounded the doctors and the lawyers with his wisdom at 12 years old. But we don't see him again after his, after his uh, confounding them at 12 for 18 years. And I wonder, if there is some synergy between the 18 years of his disappearance and the 18 years of her infirmity. After 18 years, he returns to the synagogue from time to time to wrestle and orchestrate in an adverse situation so that he can accomplish what God has for him to do. Now, I wrote down some things that I want you to get out of this message. And if you're taking notes, I want you to get these because these are important. Number one, everything God has for you will require courage. Everything God has for you will require courage. It's not just faith. It's not just prayer. It will require courage. Walking into rooms with antagonists takes courage. Everything God has for you will require courage. Everything you've been dreaming about, he's been talking to you about, He's been forecasting in your future. It's been prophesied to you about everything that God has for you. Just because it's for you doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Everything God has for you will require courage. So you got to get rid of your fear. I don't mean you don't feel it. I mean you don't allow the feeling to control your movement. <laughs> That's what courage is. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is what overrides the fear that makes you able to feel the fear and do it anyway. You have walked away from some things that God had for you because once you saw the price of it, you gave up on it because it wasn't easy, as easy in reality as it was in fantasy. Everything God has for you will require courage. Number two, avoid transactional relationships with God. That's what prosperity preaching is. If you do this, he'll do that. Avoid transactional relationships with God. God, if you just do this, I'll serve you. If you do this, I'll praise you. If you heal that, I'll serve you with all of my heart. If you do this, I'll preach the gospel. God is not into transactional relationships. You cannot hold him hostage and make your obedience predicated upon him doing certain things in order for you to obey him. You got to praise him with no socks. You got to praise him with no shoes. You got to praise him with no house. 
You got to praise him with no husband. You got to praise him if you don't have a child. You got to praise him whether your church is big or small, whether they like you or don't like you, whether they fire you or give you a raise. You cannot have a transactional relationship with God. It is the quickest way to prove that you're illegitimate because if you are a legitimate son, you will endure chastisement. If you cannot endure the chastening hand of the Lord, you have proven that you're not legitimate. God is not transactional in his relationship. That's the second thing I want you to get. Number three, rejection doesn't equate to abandonment. Just because somebody rejects you doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. Winning people is not the equivalent of the favor and presence of God. Some of you think that the sign of God's favor is everybody being in agreement with you. You are never going to get everybody in agreement with you about anything. So don't let their rejection trigger your abandonment issues. Jesus never would have went into the synagogue if he was worried about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These two different groups of people had two different, completely different theological ideas. They didn't like each other at all, but isn't it amazing how enemies will get together to fight you? People who don't like each other and you heard them talk about each other and now they're all together fighting you that's what Jesus walked into when he walked into the room. Number four, you don't always need more power as much as you need more patience. This is what I want you to get out of this. Patience. 18 years. Patience. Patience. Power does not, you don't need more power as much as you need more patience. Everything's not supposed to work out in your 20s. Everything's not supposed to work out in your 30s. If you're talking about finances, most billionaires became billionaires in, in, at least in their late 50s. So if it doesn't happen today, it doesn't mean that God said no. Let me say it this way, delayed does not mean denied. You don't always need more power as much as you need more patience. Number six, I think I am. Five, thank you. Miracles can still be performed in mayhem. That God can still perform miracles in the midst of mayhem. You think you gotta put out every fire before God can work. When the truth of the matter is, God is a present help in the time of trouble. You need him in the fiery furnace. He doesn't put out the fire before he comes in. He works in the middle of the fiery furnace. He works right in the middle of the storm. He, you don't need everything to be working out good in order for God to be present. You don't need your family to be functional, your friends to be complicit, compliant. You don't need your bank account to be overflowing. You don't need to be in the best condition for God to do his work. In fact, he said, my strength is made perfect in your when you're weak then I'm strong when you can't see no way then I show up in your life let the weak say I'm strong let the poor say I'm rich do you hear what I'm talking to you about the mayhem that's around you is trying to distract you from the miracle that's about to happen in you and you think it's your job to fix the mayhem. Let, the may let God conduct the mayhem. You focus on the miracle that God can conduct in your life in spite of what you're going through. 
sometimes because of what you're going through. If, if you didn't have enemies, he wouldn't have no need to set a table before you. Sometimes God will wait till the enemies are there to perform the miracle to use you as a sign to convince the enemy that he is on your side. Glory to God. Everybody in trouble, holler at your boy. If you're in trouble and God didn't deliver you out of the trouble, he's going to use the trouble you're in to create a platform to show how strong he is in the middle of the situation. He's going to show them that you don't have to have them in order for him to bless you. He's going to show them that if he is for you, he's more than the world against you. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody in this room can testify that God will make you a sign. He will make you a burning bush in the desert. He will lift you up as a brazen serpent in the wilderness. He will put you in a situation and show you off. And number six, the enemy hides opportunity in adversity. The enemy hides opportunity in adversity. The Bible says when Jesus was baptized in Jordan, in the Jordan River, straightway he came up out of the water and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove and the heavens opened up and the Father spoke from heaven and endorsed him and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And that same Holy Spirit that endorsed him and identified him and the same voice that said he is my son is the same power that led him into the wilderness to be tempted. And there was an opportunity. The enemy hides opportunities in opposition. <laughs> he hides opportunities in opposition to booby trap it so that fake Christians can't get it. You got to be a real soldier of the cross to take a licking and keep on ticking to go through hell and high water and keep on praising God, to lift your hands with tears coming down your face and your hands still go up. Oh, I feel something about to break loose in this place. That's what I want you to get out of this message. The, 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 the music you heard at the beginning that seemed so ill-placed is the ninth symphony of Ludwig van Beethoven. And if you allow me just a few minutes, I want you to understand, Ludwig van Beethoven was baptized at 17 years old. He didn't even live to be 60. And yet his contributions still live today. His music has become the national anthem for several different countries. He has done nine different symphonies and started on a tenth that never got completed. The ninth was his last completed symphony. And he is famous for many of them, but none of them compare to the ninth symphony. The ninth symphony is done in D minor. It is a powerful arrangement and a unique arrangement because he broke all the rules to do it. You see, up until Ludwig van Beethoven, nobody had ever done a symphony that had a choral piece inside of it. But he takes a poem called Ode to Joy and makes it the lyrics 
inside the symphony and then brings in vocalists to sing along with the symphony and it's common now but back then it was unheard of for anybody to mix chorals with symphonies. You got to be willing to be out of step with what is normal around you in order to become who God created you to be. Beethoven, equally as famous as Mozart, goes down in history because he was a rule breaker. He didn't fit in because it was not more important to him to be accepted by the people than it was to get out of him the creativity that was down inside of him. Oh my God, where are my creative people? Creative people will always be criticized because your creativity makes other people uncomfortable because they want you to fit in a little box. They want you to be predictable. They want you to obey the rules they made. But if you're gonna discover your real strength, you gotta mix stuff together that has never come together before. It took faith to compose, to direct and perform what had never been done before. History says they almost had to break up fights before he did the Ninth Symphony because he was such a rule breaker. He was so different. Look at the mayhem around him. Look at the chaos around him. Look at all of the controversy around him. And yet he maintained his focus in the middle of the fight. I don't know whose word that is, but God said maintain your focus in the middle of the fight. Don't let winning the fight distract you from the focus that God gave you. It was not Beethoven's job to break up the fight. It was Beethoven's job to direct the symphony. to, but God is getting ready to conduct something in your life that's going to blow your mind. Shout yes, somebody. Most people think that the most powerful moment of the miracle is when they see it occur. Like when Jesus calls the woman up front and he heals her, then they get it. They don't understand that it takes faith in the wait. Come on with me, people. Come on, online, online, I need you to make some noise. I need to be able to hear you. I know you thousands of miles away, but I want to hear you holler in your living room. It takes faith for the wait. You don't need faith when it happens. For if a man seeth that which he hopes for, why does he yet then hope for it? Anybody can believe it when it happens. Imagine with me the people marching around the Jericho wall. And we talk about shout for the Lord has given you the city. But I'm not sure it was the shout that broke the wall. I believe it was the silent march that preceded it. The marching when it looks like nothing is happening. The marching when it looks like it's not gonna work. The marching around the wall when the chariots are riding 
around the wall and there's not even a crack in it. Whoever I'm preaching it to, you don't even see a crack in the wall. But keep on marching. Don't say nothing. Don't murmur. Don't complain. Don't complain because it is the contrast between the silence and the shout that causes the reverberation to reach a pitch so strong that the wall begins to crack. So if you can't endure the silence of the march, if you can't endure the silence of the 18 years of being bowed over, if you can't endure the silence of 18 years of missing history, it is the refusal of the woman with the issue of blood to succumb to death for 12 long years with a hemorrhaging body. Suppose she had given up on the 10th year. Suppose she had given up at 10 and a half years. Suppose she had given up at, 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 on the eve of the 11th year or 11 and a half years. It was 12 long years. 12 years where she had spent all of her substance and had no return. 12 years of taking the advice of physicians that only made her worse. Suppose she got discouraged on the 10th year and said, I'm broke and I'm lonely and I'm tired of these doctors. I might as well commit suicide and die. My problem with suicide is that suicide will kill your, will not only kill your past, it will destroy your future. And this could be the year. Shake somebody and say, this could be the year. This could be the month. This could be the week. This could be the service. This could be the service. This, this, this Pentecost Sunday could be the service. This could be the service. Somebody holler, don't miss it. If the woman hadn't been there in that Sabbath day service, suppose she had missed it. Jesus was not a regular teacher in the synagogue. It just so happened that he was teaching in the synagogue on that day. It was her habit to worship. It was his appearance that was startling. You have to develop a habit of being faithful in season, out of season, good times, bad times, crack in the wall, no crack in the wall, lots of money, no money, feeling good, feeling bad, slap somebody and say, this could be your day. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. Don't let the devil talk you down. Don't let the devil back you into a corner. Don't let the devil make you quit. Don't let the devil make you walk away. This could be the Sunday. Nobody gets to where they're trying to go easily. You got to fail your way up. You got to fail your way forward. You got to be willing to trip if you're going to be able to walk. You got to be willing to stumble if you're going to learn how to move. You'll never be able to walk if you don't let the baby fall. Baby, you got to fall. Imagine with me, I couldn't, I cannot imagine why this woman doesn't get more credit. We're always talking about the woman with the issue of blood. We don't give this woman any credit. The woman with the issue of blood only waited 12 years. This woman was twisted for 18 years. The woman with the issue of blood came crawling for her healing. This woman didn't even ask to be healed. Oh, yeah. Go there, Dad. Go there. There is nowhere in this text 
where this woman asked to be healed. She didn't crawl after him. She didn't holler out like blind Bartimaeus. She didn't scream. She didn't say, oh, that I might receive my sight. She didn't say, Jesus, I'm tired of this. Every time I get ready to step into the water, somebody gets in my way. She didn't blame nobody for her condition. She didn't say a word for 18 years. You see, the synagogue was not known for miracles. The synagogue was not known for the spectacular. The synagogue was the place where people came to, gave, to give worship to God. But what did she have to give worship about? The scriptures didn't line up with her situation. The scripture says that you are fearfully and marvelously made. Her situation said she's twisted and misfigured. And what the disease, the particular disease that, that archaeologists suggested this woman, historians suggested this woman had, is still incurable. I played the classical music at first, not only in recognition of Beethoven, I'm gonna bring this around in a minute, but I want you to see something. Classical music has a neurological effect on the frontal lobe of the cortex. It affects the brain. Some studies suggest that if a pregnant woman plays classical music, her baby will become more intelligent in the womb because classical music is a mixture of so many diverse components. This is not psychology, this is neurology. It has been suggested that classical music reduces the likelihood of, of Alzheimer's. It, it, it retains the ability to think, to comprehend, to remember, to concentrate. Classical music has a direct effect on the brain. So let the music play. it is the complexity of the classical music. Perhaps it is the diversity of so many different sounds, the, c c the cacophony of sounds combined in such a way that it causes the neurons in the brain to fire differently in order to hear both the kettle drums and the violinists the flutist and the harp. The brain has to use more neurons in order to process. In, order, in fact, I'm suggesting to you that classical music is the gymnasium that the, that the biological brain works out in to process. Until you can process good and evil, right and wrong, just and unjust. Got this, but I didn't get that. Got the other, but I didn't get this part right here. Been through hell and hot water, but I made good grades. Made good grades, but my body is shaped funny. My body is shaped good, but my mind is not too sharp. Until you can process 
all the Jesus is conducting in a critical moment successfully, powerfully. It is the same effect of Beethoven. He's mixing things that don't even go together. He's got believers, he's got Pharisees, He's got Sadducees. He's got all of it conducted together in the same text. And there is a woman in the crowd, one woman who has not opened her mouth. She is silent. She says nothing. She asks nothing. She makes no noise. And Jesus was teaching. After 18 years, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. After 18 years of her being twisted. May I suggest to you that the twisting of the woman's body is symbolic of the twisting of the synagogue. I do, I do not, I do, I, do, I, do, I do not know, I do not know, I do not know, I do not know which one is more deformed, her body or the synagogue. I do not know, I do not know, I do not know because, because the synagogue had been praying for the Messiah and they're in the presence of the Messiah, but they're too twisted to ever even see that I that speak unto thee am he is not the woman emblematic of the condition of the synagogue and they're both occurring at the same time both having the historicity of 18 years since he visited can I go deeper Oh my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. All of this is happening simultaneously. This woman has gotten up this morning and she has, she has gotten up. Trying to get there. Not having the benefit of fitting in with what we call normal. Some of us are more focused on being normal than we are on getting there. We want to fit in so bad that we won't even go into places if we feel uncomfortable until you are willing to feel uncomfortable, you won't discover the power of God. She comes in twisted. She was different. See, the reason I love the Ninth Symphony of Ludwig van Beethoven is that he performed it, it was different, it was unusual, it had both chorale and poetry and symphonic impact at the same time simultaneously, and he directed it, and by the time he gets to the end of his direction, by the time he gets to his conclusion, by the time he reaches the climax and the voices are in there and the music is in there and the drama is in there and it crescendos and it comes to a crashing end. He got five standing ovations. Five standing 
ovations that he couldn't hear. You see, Ludwig van Beethoven composed, wrote, directed, death. You ain't right till you got something wrong with you. <laughs> you ain't right till you twist it up in some kind of way. You ain't right till the odds are against you. You ain't right till you're backed up in a corner and shoved to the wall. You ain't right. Beethoven's music outlasts almost any other composer that you can think of. And he wrote it deaf. How can you sit there and make excuses for not performing? Beethoven had more music in his head than he did in his ears and he couldn't even hear the clapping of the people because he was focused on what he heard in his head. History records that they had to physically come get him and turn him around to see the reaction of the people because in order to bring his best stuff, he had to block out all the noise that was on the inside. Archaeologists who have dug up his body say that in his day they ate their dinner on lead plates and that the lead plates probably led to his deafness. And that the, the earlier symphonies, he hid from people that he couldn't hear. But he could, but he couldn't. The, they don't hear me, Jesus. He could hear, Dexter, but he couldn't hear. He, he could hear it. He had more music in his head than they had in their ears. And he went inside of his head and composed and wrote and directed death. This woman comes to church, twist it. And she still Worshiping. Yes, yes, Twisted. Yes, yeah. She asked him for nothing. She didn't ask him, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Oh, that I might receive my sight. She didn't say, oh, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. She didn't say, if I can touch the hem of his garment. She didn't say a word. She didn't come to get anything. She was not transactional. She was relational. She was coming because God was God. If I don't have no car, if I don't have no shoes, if I don't have no feet, if I can't see, if I can't hear, if you don't like me, if you hate me, if you unfollow me, if you leave me, you can't stop what I hear in my head that if God be for me, he's more than the world against me. You don't have to have everything to do anything. Y'all didn't hear me. Let me try y'all. You don't have to have everything to do anything. You can do it with no husband. You can do it with no job. You can do it with no friends. You can do it with no help. This woman crawled her way into the service and the Bible said this is one of the few times if ever that anybody ever interrupted Jesus while he was teaching without uttering a word. Her silence interrupted him. The Holy Ghost told me if I preach this word, it was going to change somebody's life. I don't know who it is in the house. 
if you just keep your mouth shut and hold your peace and let the Lord fight your battles, God is going to work in your behalf. He's going to bring you out. He's going to bring you through. He's going to bring you over. And the Bible said, the Bible said, the Bible said, He saw her. He saw her and stopped teaching. He saw her and stopped in the middle of his message. And he did something that makes no sense to me. I remember I was in South Africa and Ambassador Andrew Young was there. And, and I came up to him and, and, and he started getting up out of his wheelchair. And I said, oh no, no. I came over where he was, I knelt down by the chair. I said, how dare you, you don't have to come to me. I will come to you. And I wondered in my mind, Jesus, you're a young man. You're 30 years old. Why would you call a crippled woman yeah. who could in no wise lift up herself and say to her, come here when you know she can't. Come here. God will ask you to do stuff that you cannot do. Because when you try to do it, there's a miracle in doing what you cannot do. He will ask a man with a withered hand to stretch forth your hand. He will ask a dead man to come out of the grave. Stop waiting on God to make your miracle convenient. Look at her courage! She has to get up in front of all of these people and drag her twisted body to the front where you won't even come if your hair's not done. He saw her, I believe doesn't mean that he just saw her. He saw her 18 years of dealing with stuff. I wanna to talk to people that's been dealing with stuff for a long time. And the devil is telling you, you miss your turn and you waited too late and it's not gonna happen and you're not gonna get it. And the devil is a lie. I want you to know that God sees you. He sees where you are. He sees your circumstance. He sees your faithfulness. He sees your commitment. He sees you praising him while all hell is breaking loose in your life. He, he saw her. And because she had been faithful enough to find a way to inconvenience herself enough to get up out of that house, he called her. I believe to a degree she was healed before she got up there. The very fact that she got up there. Since the Bible says she could in no wise lift up herself and nobody carried her. But the problem with you is you keep waiting on somebody to carry you. And your excuse is I had no man to carry me to the pool. So you spent 38 years of suffering because your excuses have made you sick. They have made you sick. Anything you don't have, you don't need. Can I preach this? <laughs> he saw her. He called her.
you told her something about herself that she did not know. He says, woman, thou art loosed, loosed from thine infirmity. I start studying it out the word loosed in the Greek is translated in other translations as divorced. Divorce is to break covenant. Yeah. I break covenant with everything that's had you twisted, that's had you broken, that's had you disturbed, that's had you upset. I break covenant with it right now. I break covenant with everything that's had you upset, upset and uptight and disarranged and twisted and I challenge you to come broken, come twisted, come bleeding, come hurting, come suffering. But whatever you do, I challenge you to come up here. God wants. She came. She came. It wasn't pretty, but she came. It wasn't nice, but she came. Listen at them murmuring. Listen at them whispering. Listen at them making noise. And he tells her something. He says, woman, thou art divorced. Your covenant is broken between the thing that bound you all these years. That means there had to be a relationship between her infirmity and her that had lasted 18 years and he didn't marry them. Oh God. He divorced. He divorced. He divorced them. He broke them up. I break every yoke that stood in your way. I break it in the name of Jesus. I command liberty to come in your life. You are loose from your infirmity. As soon as you get it, you're going to praise his name. It ain't hit you yet. But if you believe what the scriptures have said, you are loosed from it. You are loose from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Slap somebody and say, I just got loose. I just got loose. Forgive me if I got loud, but I got loose. Forgive me if I leap, but I got loose. Forgive me if I holler, but I got loose. Forgive me if I run, but I got loose. Forgive me if I get wild, I got loose. I got loose. Is there anybody in here that just got I got loose, 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 I got loosed. I got loose. I came to church this morning and I got loose. I came to service and I got loose. I didn't know I was going to get loose, but I got loose. I didn't know I was in covenant with the thing I was trying to kill, but I just got loosed. I got divorced. I got set free. I got liberated. The chain just broke. My generational curse just broke. My bondage just broke. My mentality just broke. My attitude just broke. On Pentecost Sunday, I got loose. Somebody crazy. 
give me 50 seconds of crazy praise on Pentecost Sunday. Touch five people and say, I'm out of it. I'm out of it. I'm out of being bent. I'm out of being twisted. I'm out of being broken. I'm out of it. I'm out of excuses. I'm out of worry. I'm out of depression. I'm out of fear. I'm out of worry. I'm out of pain. You can stay in if you want to stay in, but this girl got loose. This man got loose. This boy got loose. This preacher got loose. This deacon got loose. I need some loose folk that'll take over this building and give, give God a praise. Like your loose. Like your handcuffs are loose. Like your shackles just fell off your feet. Somebody give me a praise. Uh, you got 10 seconds left. and the Sadducees started arguing with Jesus. You shouldn't have healed that woman on the Sabbath day. But the woman didn't answer them a word. The Bible said her response to their criticism was she glorified God. In the middle of your antagonist, I dare you to take this moment. Don't answer them a word. Just give God a praise. Pharisees and your Sadducees are part of your symphony. 
their part of the symphony. Their criticism, their antagonism, their discontentment is part of your symphony. But you're not the conductor. Let the conductor address your naysayers. That's not your instrument. You are an instrument of praise. If you just play your instrument, we gonna get this symphony done in here. You are an instrument of praise. God created you to be to the praise of his glory. And if you just do your job, we gonna have a symphony. Hallelujah. In a synagogue. Let every praiser in the house do your job. Do it in the balcony. Do it in the back row. Do it in the front. Do it in the pulpit. One, two, three, go. I can't hear you. I can't hear what you're saying. I can't hear what you're doing. I'm deaf to it. I'm deaf to it. I ain't got time to do nothing but give God the praise. I'm, I'm, I'm giving him the praise. I'm, 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 I'm giving God. I'm giving God the praise. I can't hear you. Come on. Hey, neighbor, if you're not out yet, you can make a down payment. Not give him a praise like you lost your mind. Make a down payment. Ha, ha, ha.
Somebody just broke covenant with something. I can feel it in the room. I can feel it. I don't know what's going on in your house. I don't know what's going on on your job, but over in here, somebody just broke covenant with something that had them twisted all out of sorts. But now the Lord has touched you. On Pentecost Sunday, you're having a personal Pentecost. And the DNA of God is hovering over you. And I don't know who you're going to be, but you ain't going to never be who you used to be. You're not going to never be. On the day of Pentecost, the church was never the same. Again. This is Beethoven's last completed symphony. It has become the national anthem for several different countries all over the world. No symphony worth its salt doesn't perform it. It has passed the test of time. It is way over a century years old. It is just as relevant today as it was when he composed it and wrote it and directed it, death. What you are doing now will outlive you, will outlast you, and your blindness cannot stop it, your deafness cannot stop it, your struggle cannot stop it. Your fear cannot stop it. Your insecurity cannot stop it. Yeah. He did it. Death. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful Jesus. You know why? why? What Beethoven was to the orchestra, Christ is to the text. Yes. 